working on this issue. Thank you very much. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. No representative or indeed consultant working for the Scottish Conservative Party has ever met with the disgraced data harvesting company Cambridge Analytica or its pa parent company. Can the First Minister... They don't like it, but it was good enough for Ian Blackford to ask at PMQs. It's good enough for me to ask at FMQs. Can the First Minister say the same about the Scottish Government or the SNP? Yeah. First Minister. Well, as we uh, said earlier this week, a consultant working for the SNP did meet with Cambridge Analytica. That happened in February 2016. But the SNP has never worked with Cambridge Analytica. We've never hired them. We've never paid them any money to do any work for it. Uh, that surely is the fundamental point. I'm not sure, in spite of what uh, Ruth Davidson has said, I'm not sure the Conservative Party as a whole, or indeed the UK government under uh, the Conservative Party, can say the same. We know that the links between Cambridge Analytica and uh, SCL, their parent company, are many and legion. For example, uh, a former chairman of Oxford Conservative Association uh, used to uh, run the uh, SCL company. Uh, there are reports that he's now actually the CEO of Cambridge uh, Analytica. Uh, SCL's, SCL's founding chairman was a former Tory MP. Uh, a director of the company uh, donated more than £700,000 to the Conservative Party. Uh, we know... We know that the UK government has had uh, reportedly a close working relationship with SCL. The MOD paid them £200,000 for carrying out two separate projects. According to The Guardian, SCL Group was actually granted by the Ministry of Defence what's called uh, List X status. That means they can access secret documents. Uh, the MOD also paid uh, more than £40,000 to a branch of SCL for data ana analytics. And it's been reported, and I can only uh, say what's been reported, that a Cambridge Analytica executive advised the Foreign Office on lessons gleaned from the Trump election campaign. We also know that Alexander uh, Nix, uh, who of course was the former CEO of Cambridge Analytica, uh, in a letter, uh, I think, uh, to a foreign government, claimed back in 2010 that he had worked with the UK Conservative Party. So I can say two things categorically. The SNP has never worked with Cambridge Analyt uh, Analytica, and the Scottish Government has never worked with Cambridge Analytica. I'm not sure the Conservative Party or the UK Government can say the same thing. Ruth Davidson. First Minister had bothered to listen to my first question. Okay, order, please. You know the party that I'm in charge of has never held any meetings, never had any emails, never had any contacts, nothing. But let's get back to the party that she's in charge of, shall we? And let's just review what we found out this week. A former Cambridge Analytica director revealed that the SNP had indeed met the firm. Now, I know that the SNP have raised sanctimony to an art form, but what stinks here is the reek of hypocrisy. Because when it comes to the dealings... Yeah, yeah, come on, come on. When it comes to the dealings that others have had with Cambridge Analytica, the First Minister and her party have spent weeks demanding full transparency. Yet when it comes to the SNP, it took a whistleblower giving evidence in a parliamentary committee before facts even began to be dragged out into the open. So the First Minister has demanded full transparency of others. Can she really, hand on heart, say that the SNP has shown it this week? First Minister. I think Ruth Davidson's missed something because here's what Alexander Nix, the former CEO of Cambridge Analytica, said not this week uh, in a Westminster committee, but actually in February at a Westminster committee in response to a question about companies pitching for work. He said, it's not uncommon for us to go and speak to political parties. Indeed, in this country, I think I've spoken with every political party, Labour, the Liberal Democrats, UKIP, the SNP and the Conservatives. So, yeah. 
They have pitched to every political party, uh, and the SNP is very clear. They tried to sell us their services. As I said, that was in the early part of 2016. Uh, a meeting took place. But back then, before any of the concerns that we're talking about right now uh, had come to light, the SNP decided that this was not a company we wanted exactly. to work with. Exactly. We judged then that they were a bunch of cowboys. If only the UK government had done that, then they might not have some of the links that I've already read out. Ruth Davidson. But First Minister, the UK Conservative Party weren't the ones that were caught out spreading allegations about others. That was all on you. That was all on you. And let's put, let's put the First Minister's commitment to transparency to the test. Yesterday, she was asked directly when the meeting or meetings took place and who attended. And our party's leader in Westminster was asked likewise. And she failed to answer yesterday and he claims he never knew. Now, we've got a little bit further today. So let's get on to answer these questions. Who was the SNP consultant who held a meeting with Cambridge Analytica? When in February did it take place? And where did it take place? Because these are very simple questions to someone who's committed to full transparency. Full transparency. First Minister, please keep the order down. If First Ruth Davidson had listened, she would have heard me say the meeting took place in February uh, 2016. Uh, I am not going to name somebody who was working for the SNP as a consultant, somebody who's done nothing wrong. There is no wrongdoing. I am here to answer questions on behalf of the Scottish Government, but I'm happy to answer questions on behalf of the SNP. I'm the leader of the party, and I'm not going to name somebody who's done nothing wrong, who was working on behalf of the yeah, SNP, exactly. in order that a witch hunt can be carried yeah, out exactly. into that uh, person. But if, if we're talking about transparency, then perhaps Ruth Davidson can answer some of the points about the connection. She says the Conservatives uh, haven't done a range of things. Well, the Conservatives, we know, or it certainly has been reported, has accepted donations from a director of the parent company of Cambridge Analytica. Does Ruth Davidson think that's OK? Or here, we know, here's something else which is perhaps closer to home for Ruth Davidson, because there's another company that's uh, reported to have very close links with Cambridge Analytica. That's Aggregate IQ. Now, remember that a group, uh, Constitutional Research Council, uh, run by a former vice chairman of the Scottish Conservative Party. It was them that gave the donation to the DUP's Brexit campaign. We still don't know the source of that donation, but we know that some of that donation was spent on aggregate IQ uh, that have links with Cambridge Analytica. So if Ruth Davidson wants to be so transparent, will she tell us today what was the source of the donation procured by a former chairman of the Scottish Tory party? Uh, I think it's the Conservative Party and the UK government that's mired in links uh, to Cambridge Analytica and its various associates. The SNP's never done any work with them because unlike the Conservatives, unlike the UK government, when we met them, uh, we realised there were a bunch of cowboys. If only Ruth Davidson's colleagues had done the same. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, let's get back to First Minister's questions. Questions to the First Minister. Because here is transparency, SNP style. Transparency, SNP style is fling out allegations at opponents, yeah. it's fail to set out your own record, it's deny you know anything about it, yeah. and then when you're caught out, it's giving half answers to legitimate questions. The First Minister says she's been upfront and transparent, but with everything, everything that the SNP's done over the last month, including keeping their Westminster leader in the dark, yeah. I wonder if to the rest of us, it just looks pretty shifty. First Minister. Well, Ruth Davidson has said that all of the links that I've read out between these companies and the Conservative Party or UK government are allegations. So when she has the opportunity to review the official report, uh, I'll challenge her today to come back and tell me which ones are untrue. Which of the links that I have set out between her colleagues and these companies are untrue? But in terms of the SNP, let's cut to the chase and get to the nub of the matter. Uh, yes, uh, two years ago, before the concerns that we're talking about uh, now had come to light, 
somebody on behalf of the SNP had a meeting with Cambridge Analytica. We decided we didn't want to do any work with them. And as a result, we've never hired them. We've never paid them any money. They have never done any work for the SNP and they have never done any work for the Scottish Government. The same cannot be said, in my view, for the UK Government, and I don't know uh, for sure whether the same can be said for uh, the Conservative Party either. But Ruth Davidson started that last question by saying, let's get back to First Minister's questions. Well, let's get back to the responsibilities of the First Minister and the Scottish Government. Here's some of the things Ruth Davidson could have come to this chamber and asked me about today. She could have come and asked me about the work to save by Fab. She could have come and asked me. She could have come and asked me about the extra money announced yesterday for farmers to help them with the impact of recent weather. She could have come and asked me about the extra money for the initiative to combat domestic abuse announced this week. She could have come and asked me about the update report on getting broadband to households across the country. Uh, she could have come and asked me about the major expansion of childcare training places that's been announced in the last few days. But because Ruth Davidson doesn't have a leg to stand on on any of these things, all she can do is come to this chamber and spread about baseless smears. Well, I think it's the Conservative Party and the UK government that have got questions to answer. And I look forward to her response to which of the links that I set out is not true. I recognise the level of political interest in the subject, but could I just say, uh, and I'll let it go in this case, but can we try and stick to the First Minister's responsibilities and First Minister's questions from both sides, from both sides. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, this morning the Auditor General told the Audit, Commission, uh, the Audit Committee of this Parliament that repeated warnings about the finances of NHS Tayside were not taken seriously. Is the Auditor General wrong? First Minister. I, I don't think it is the case that uh, the Scottish Government has not worked hard to support NHS Tayside. As I heard the Auditor General, uh, and I think perhaps the comment uh, that Richard Leonard is referring to is the Auditor General referred to uh, a, a statement in one of the previous reports about the use of endowment funds and certainly there was a, a line in one of the previous reports uh, recording the fact of the transfer of endowment funds. The point that the Health Secretary has made and I will make again today is that at no point was that flagged up as a concern to the Scottish Government. If it had been at that time then action would have been taken. Um, the Health Secretary has exercised her ministerial powers. She's done that uh, I think for the right reasons and in the right way to make sure that the leadership of NHS Tayside is strengthened so that they can go on uh, delivering high quality patient care but also undertake the transformation uh, in the services that they need to do and I would hope uh, that notwithstanding all of the legitimate issues and I would say uh, to Richard Leonard at least he's come to this chamber with a, a genuine serious legitimate issue that are within within the responsibilities of uh, the first minister but whatever our uh, differences of opinion around this I hope that Richard Leonard will support the action that the health secretary has rightly taken. Richard Leonard. First minister the situation at NHS Tayside did not come as a surprise to anyone who was paying attention. Year after year the health board sought a bailout Year after year, Audit Scotland warned that this was not sustainable, and year after year, your government has been in denial about the scale of the problem. Between repaying loans, repaying the endowment fund, and finding other efficiency savings, NHS Tayside now needs to make over £200 million worth of cuts over the next five years. First Minister, do you agree with me that this will mean even longer waiting times and even more cancelled operations for the people of Tayside. First Minister. Uh, no, no, I don't. Uh, the purpose of the Scottish Government providing brokerage is in order to ensure that patient services are not affected as the board undertakes its transformation plans. I also do not agree with Richard Leonard's characterisation of the role of the Scottish Government. Yes, there have been issues in Tayside for some time, but let me just run through the steps that the Scottish Government and the Health Secretary have taken. Uh, so when the five-year transformation 
plan was launched in 2015-16. At that time, the Scottish Government put in place specific support arrangements. Uh, then in March 2017, the Scottish Government appointed Professor Lewis Ritchie uh, to chair an assurance and advisory group. In June 2017, when uh, Lewis Ritchie produced his first report, the Scottish Government established a transformation support team, providing intensive support for the board between July and December 2017. We then had the second report of the assurance and advisory group in February of this year. It was shortly after that that the issue of e-health funding came to light. At that point, Grant Thornton uh, were appointed by the Health Secretary to look into that in detail. That report has been published to Parliament. And of course, since the issue of the endowment fund has come to light, the Health Secretary has taken the action she's taken. So at every stage, there has been support for NHS Tayside. But when the culmination of issues uh, reached the point it did, the Health Secretary rightly decided that the leadership of the board uh, required to be strengthened and that's why the steps have been taken in the last two weeks. Richard Leonard. But First Minister, none of those steps which you took worked. Here we have a health board raiding charity funds to pay the bills and that is after fiddling the accounts. And what makes this even worse is that this is all happening in Tayside under the nose of the Health Secretary who is a Member of Parliament for Dundee. First Minister, it's too late for Shona Robeson to be an honest broker in the NHS Tayside affair. Will the First Minister reflect on this? And will she face up to the fact that the time has come for her Health Secretary to go? First Minister. You. I'll continue to, to give my support as First Minister to the job the Health Secretary is doing. Uh, to strengthen the leadership of the NHS Tayside Board with uh, the new Chief Executive and Chair arrangements that have been put in place and to make sure that that board has the support to undertake the transformation that it needs to do. That's what we will continue to focus on because actually uh, in the final analysis here, what is important are the services to patients. Actually, NHS Tayside provides a very high level of patient service and our job, the Health Secretary's and mine, is to make sure they continue to do that. So with the greatest of respect to Richard Leonard, that's what I will continue to focus on and that's what the Health Secretary will continue to focus on. I have a number of supplementaries. Uh, the first from Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Monday the 9th of April marked the first time in Glenothes's 70-year history that there was no GP on duty at night caring for the town. The words of locally retired GP Dr Bob Grant. Fife's Health and Social Care Partnership's decision to close out of hours provision means people from Glenrothes, Dunfermline and St Andrews are now being made to travel to Kirkcaldy. Does the First Minister share my concerns about the complete absence of any public consultation, the costs it will place on individuals that don't have access to a vehicle, and the resource burden that this move directly forces upon staff at the Victoria Hospital in Kirkcaldy? First Minister. Well, can I thank Jenny Goruth for raising what is an important local issue uh, for her. Uh, recent changes to the out-of-hours primary care services in Fife are a short-term measure to ensure that appropriate levels of patient safety are maintained. I understand that a public consultation on a full range of longer-term options, including maintaining services at the existing four out-of-hours centres, will begin in June. And, of course, overnight primary care emergency services will still be available at Victoria Hospital in Kirkcaldy. Uh, so I would encourage uh, not just Jenny Gilruth and other local members, uh, but the local population in Fife, when that public consultation uh, starts, to make sure that they make their views uh, known to that. Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Um, last night, SEPA issued a final warning to the operators of the Moss Moran ethylene plant, almost a year after surrounding communities were kept awake for days by noise and light pollution caused by flaring. There have been even more incidents of illegal flaring in recent months. So can I ask the First Minister, what is her definition of a final warning? First Minister. Well, SEPA is an independent regulatory body. It is for them to set out what actions they will take if uh, warnings that they uh, issue are not complied with. Uh, we've discussed this issue in the Chamber before. I absolutely understand the concerns of local people uh, around Miss Morin and, and the issues uh, that have caused uh, those concerns. But it is absolutely right and proper that SEPA is the organisation that takes uh, this forward. I will uh, happily ask SEPA to write directly uh, to the member to set out clearly uh, what its further action will be should it deem that most modern uh, has not complied uh, with any conditions that it set out. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the case of Ola Mary from Copebridge, who was ordered to leave the UK by the Home Office despite being married to a Scottish citizen and having a Scottish daughter. Ola and her family, who are in the gallery today, were delighted that the intervention of the Cabinet Secretary and local politicians led to the decision being paused for review. 
But will the First Minister confirm that the Scottish Government will continue to put pressure on the UK Government to ensure that Ola is permitted to permanently remain at her home in Coatbridge with her husband and daughter, and further to continue to demand the devolution of immigration law so Scottish citizens aren't affected like this in the future? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, welcome the Merry family to the public gallery today? I'm sure the whole chamber will want to, to welcome them. Uh, Fiona Hislop raised this case with the Home Secretary last week, and we will continue to make appropriate representations to give uh, the Merry family the peace of mind that they require around uh, the right uh, of Mrs Merry to remain permanently in Coatbridge with her husband and her daughter. Um, I think this case and the appalling treatment uh, of the children of the Windrush generation that we've seen come to light this week demonstrate perhaps more clearly than anything has previously that we urgently need across the whole UK a humane immigration system, not the hostile environment that Theresa May has been so keen uh, to put in place. We need a system that respects human dignity, that recognises individual circumstances and a system that isn't focused on arbitrarily cutting numbers and forcing people unjustly to leave the country that they've come to call home. That's the kind of humane immigration policy that I want to see in place and we will continue to argue very loudly and very clearly for that. Sandra White. Uh, thank, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, this morning I received a press release here, which I believe it goes out to the press this afternoon, informing that the minor injuries unit at York Hill will close tomorrow and return to the Southern General Hospital. Now, this came as a, a great surprise to, to me, uh, and uh, will be to my constituents also, who took part in the consultation, and we're absolutely sure that the minor injuries unit was not to go to the Southern General Hospital. Would the First Minister agree with me that a PR, press release, is not the way to inform elected members or their constituents, and will the First Minister contact Greater Glasgow Health Board to convene a meeting regarding where the MIU is to go in the west of the city of Glasgow. First Minister. Firstly, I'm, I'm happy to look into uh, how the, the public information has been communicated. If what Sandra White has outlined uh, today is correct, and I have no reason, of course, to believe that it's not, then that would strike me as being unacceptable, uh, an unacceptable way for the Health Board uh, to have done that. Uh, and I'm very happy to ask the Health Board uh, to communicate directly with Sandra White. If, if I can turn to the substantive issue, which is an important one in the city of Glasgow, uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde reopened the West Glasgow Minor Injuries unit at York Hill from early January as part of their plan to manage winter pressures. That was then extended to help cover the Easter holiday period. The Health Secretary has been clear that she expects the board to ensure that the west of the city has appropriate unscheduled care provision and I know the board will soon be considering proposals as to how uh, they plan to take forward the provision of these local services and the Health Secretary will continue to monitor the progress of this work and provide updates but I will uh, make sure a message goes to Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board asking them to contact Sandra White uh, directly. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Our report this morning has found new mothers in half of Scotland cannot access specialist life-saving mental health services. The Maternal Mental Health Alliance say there is no specialist provision in Tayside, in Fife, in Dumfries and Galloway, in the Western Isles, in Orkney or in Shetland. Only Glasgow meets the required standard in the whole of the country. The First Minister was warned about this three years ago. So why is this government failing mothers and their children? First Minister. Well, this is uh, an extremely important issue, but it's why we have uh, taken the step of funding a national managed clinical network on perinatal mental health. Uh, as I'm sure Willie uh, Rennie is aware, the MCN brings together specialists on perimental, perinatal mental health, nursing, maternity and infant mental health, and it's designed to improve uh, the treatment of perinatal mental health care. The network is currently uh, delivering on a work plan that's in place, which includes assessing current provision across all levels of service de delivery in Scotland. And the report that Willie Rennie has referred to, uh, of course, will be, should be taken into account in that. Uh, and the network is also uh, looking at how it ensures that all women, uh, their children and families have equity of access to the perinatal mental health services that they need. So this is work that is ongoing. I'd be very happy to provide Willie Rennie with uh, more detail uh, of that uh, and uh, answer any further questions from him uh, as a result of that. Willie Rennie. The, the managed clinical network is a good thing, but it's far from enough. 
the, the, the institutes, the, the, the alliance here have identified where the gaps in services are. The government aren't doing enough and they're not doing enough quickly. The Royal College of Midwives is scathing of the government's record. They say the consequences of poor services can be fatal. And we shouldn't forget the tragedy of suicide is the leading cause of maternal deaths. So where is the six-week check? Where are the community networks? Why does Scotland lag behind England? I asked the First Minister about mental health almost every single week in this Parliament. And this week is yet another week when we hear of a new report on failures of this government's mental health policy. One week, it's young people waiting in age for treatment. The next, it's adults. Now it's mothers. Isn't it the case, isn't it the case that mental health is fast becoming this government's record of shame? First Minister. Mr Rennie does uh, regularly ask about mental health and I give him uh, great credit for doing that because it is an extremely serious issue. But every week when he asks me, I outline the work that the Scottish Government is doing to address the issues and concerns that have been raised. And uh, I, I guess it's easy for Willie Rennie to dismiss the managed clinical network as important but not enough. But it is the work that that managed clinical network is doing that will enable us to address the specific concerns and the uh, report that has been published today provides further evidence and information that will be very helpful in the, the work that the MCN is doing. I know, for example, that one of the things uh, that that report calls for, perhaps not surprisingly, is uh, more prioritised uh, funding and that's something we will consider uh, very seriously. In, in, in that respect, they're looking particularly at community services. So I've set out uh, in summary the work that the network is doing uh, around its work plan and that is the work that will take forward uh, the actions that address the concerns that he's been raising. So I uh, have absolutely no issue with him raising these issues. I would encourage members to continue to raise these issues uh, but I would also ask uh, and, and hope that members will appreciate the range of work whether it's about young people or this area or the other uh, aspects of mental health provision that under the auspices of our mental health strategy uh, which has recently uh, been praised by the World Health Organization who, on a recent uh, visit uh, to Scotland uh, that that work is specifically about addressing these important concerns. And some further supplementaries the first from Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. Just weeks after Gordon Aikman's death with his grieving family in the gallery, the Cabinet Secretary for Health promised a fast-tracked benefit system. She said she'd end the injustice of terminally ill people waiting months for their benefits, and I believed her. Yesterday, the Scottish Government tabled Amendment 111 to the Social Security Bill, the intent of which is to keep the failing system just as it is, reversing changes agreed at Stage 2. Given that Marie Curie have described this as very disappointing and over 50 leading doctors have expressed their deep concern in today's times, will the First Minister please intervene to ensure that people with less than two years to live get the benefits they so desperately need? First Minister. Can I, um, if I may, President Officer, can I just take a bit of time to address this issue properly? Because it is a, a serious issue. I've spent much of this morning in advance of stage three of the Social Security Bill next week discussing this very issue with the Social Security Minister. It's a difficult and it's a sensitive issue. And I'm sure Kezia Dugdale would recognise it's also a complex issue. And all MSPs who have been scrutinising this on the committee, I'm sure, would recognise this. And I want to make very clear today that the government, the Social Security Minister, will continue to listen and discuss the best way forward on this right up to the stage three uh, votes next week. Uh, on the, on the time limits, the, the change from two years, which was amended in at uh, stage two of the bill to six months, uh, relates to the difficulties that according to some clinicians uh, there are of accurately diagnosing life expectancy over a period as long as two years. But that's not the fundamental point in this. The more fundamental point I want to make is this one, which I think is alluded to in the open letter uh, that is published today. If you have a time limit that is the only basis for determining eligibility, then whether that time limit is six months or two years or whatever, you always have the risk of excluding people who should be included because time limits by their nature are arbitrary. And that's why it's the second part of the Scottish Government's amendment that actually is the most important. The second part of the amendment says it effectively means there'll be no hard or rigidly applied uh, time frame. So even for somebody who would, would not fulfil the six months time frame requirement, eligibility will still be able to be certified 
by a medical practitioner. Uh, so clinicians will still be able to use their judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and that, for me, actually, is the important thing here. And in the discussions I was having with Jean Freeman this morning, uh, we were talking about how we get away from time limits and actually focus much more on the clinical judgment. So we will continue to have discussions with anybody who's interested in this right up until uh, the final stage of this bill. But it is a difficult, it's a sensitive issue, and it's a complex issue. And I would hope all members uh, would recognise it's not a party political issue, it's one that all of us desperately want to get right. And I certainly give a commitment today that we will do our best to get it right, because that's what all of us want. And Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, given the Audit Scotland's report on contracts in NHS Highland being informal, long-running, without review, unaudited and not documented, and given the sums of public money involved, can she confirm if the Scottish Government has complete confidence in the management of NHS Highland? Or does she believe that given NHS Highland's annual overspend, that this may be yet another example of incompetent governance? First Minister. Well, I understand that the report that's been referred to here uh, relates to the provision of uh, two contracts in NHS Highland, one uh, relating to healthcare, the Nairn medical practice, and another for the carrying out of uh, vasectomies across the Highlands. And the report states that these contracts actually date from uh, 1998. Uh, they raise issues of procurement. Uh, NHS Highland has already said that they are taking the required action to implement the recommendations and uh, will monitor that via their own uh, audit committee. I would expect all health boards to follow relevant procurement regulations to ensure the best use of resources. Uh, and we've been clear that we expect NHS Highland to address the issues uh, raised in this audit report and to fully implement its recommendations, as NHS Highland has already said it's going to do. Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2013, the Unionist parties warned us that Scottish shipyards would lose out on contracts to build Royal Navy ships if Scotland were outside the UK. But now, the Westminster Tory government are encouraging overseas shipyards to compete for the latest billion pound order. Work from those would create and secure up to 6,500 jobs. Will the First Minister back calls for this work to come to the Clyde? First Minister. Yes. Yes, I will. This is work that should be in the Clyde. I would argue that this is work that was promised to the Clyde and this is work that very definitely should go to the Clyde. Um, we should be very clear. What we are uh, now seeing develop around this work and uh, the future of the shipyards is nothing short of a blatant betrayal of Scottish shipyards. Uh, promises were made to those yards by the Tories, indeed by all of the unionist parties during the referendum. They were told that there were promises of work for years to come. Uh, and they specifically said that Scotland, if it became independent, would not be able to secure that work for the Clyde because contracts couldn't go to, quotes, foreign countries. So this is an absolute betrayal and I would hope we will hear all parties across this chamber stand up for shipbuilding on the Clyde. Question number four, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am required to remind the chamber that I am a parliamentary liaison officer to the First Minister. To ask the First Minister how many Syrian refugees have been resettled in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, Scotland has welcomed around uh, 2,150 uh, people under the Syrian resettlement programme since October 2015. We remain committed to welcoming refugees seeking sanctuary from the conflict in Syria. Uh, and because of that, refugees continue to arrive and I hope all of them get a warm welcome uh, in Scotland. Uh, obviously, at this time, the Syrian community in Scotland will be worried about the current situation in Syria uh, and particularly about their family and friends who remain there and uh, my thoughts are with them. Uh, but I want to emphasize that Scotland will continue to offer a home to people fleeing war and persecution and we are committed to welcoming as many as we can of those who arrive in the UK during 2018. Ben McPherson. I thank the First Minister for that answer and as well as warmly welcoming those from Syria who have made Scotland their home, I would also like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to all of the organisations who have supported those resettling into communities across Scotland, including the services provided by a multicultural family base in Leith in my constituency. Presiding officer, like many others, I think we should all celebrate the positive impact of the resettlement programme in Scotland. However, I am also concerned about the welfare of asylum seekers from Syria who are living here out with the resettlement programme and who are therefore not receiving adequate support from the Home Office in terms of both funding and assistance to settle into communities. Therefore, does the First Minister agree with me that the Home Office must look again at what support they provide to asylum seekers 
improve the support provided and treat everyone equally. First Minister. Yes, I, I agree very strongly. Uh, with that. Firstly, can I thank uh, local authorities and all organisations who have played their part in welcoming those who have come under the Syrian resettlement programme. I attended an event at COSLA just before Christmas, I think, where uh, we were celebrating the work that had been done to make sure that that welcome was as warm uh, as it has been. Uh, but that should apply not just to those coming through the resettlement programme, but to everybody who seeks asylum in our country. We believe very strongly that integration begins from day one of arrival, not just when people have been granted refugee status. And the support that the UK government provides under the Syrian resettlement programme is very good and it's very welcome. But it also serves to highlight the gulf with the minimal support that is provided for asylum seekers uh, and indeed it creates a two-tier system. So I would encourage the UK government to extend the model of holistic support we see as part of the resettlement programme and fund the integration of asylum seekers to give them an equal chance to rebuild their lives here and fulfil the potential they and their families have. Ivan McKee. Last week, in a feeble and misguided attempt to look strong and stable, the UK government engaged in military action in Syria on the basis of flimsy evidence without waiting for the findings of an independent inquiry and at the behest of a presidential tweet. This action risks increasing the flow of refugees from that warm torn country. Does the First Minister agree with me that the UK government needs to do far more to facilitate the arrival of refugees in this country than it's done so far? First Minister. I think, that's, I think that is important because it, Regardless of anybody's views on the airstrikes that took place last weekend, and there will be uh, differing views in the community at large in Scotland, indeed there will be differing views within the Syrian community in Scotland about uh, the efficacy uh, and rights and wrongs of airstrikes, but it does underline the importance of making sure that we are welcoming those who are fleeing the conflict uh, in Syria. And I do think, I've said before and I will say again, that the UK government, for all that they do some good work here, could do much more. Um, all of us are appalled uh, at the actions of the Assad regime and uh, if it was the case, and I've got no difficulty in believing uh, his capability of launching chemical weapons attacks against his own population, all of us are appalled at that. The question is how best to deal with that. My view, and I think this has been borne out by past experience, is that isolated airstrikes do not help to resolve the underlying situation in Syria. We need to get back, as the UN Secretary General has said, there is no military solution uh, to this situation. We need to get back to finding a political solution, and I hope that is now the priority uh, of all of the countries involved. Yeah. And Ross Greer. Thank you. Recent escalations in the Syrian conflict have displaced more people from their homes and only compounded the refugee crisis. Could the First Minister confirm whether the Scottish Government owned Presswick Airport was used by the US military in their recent air campaign, which will only serve to compound this conflict? First Minister. We have discussed the issue of Presswick Airport and the commercial nature of, of what it does and the fact that what it does uh, in terms of uh, military flights is no different to what it has done all along. Uh, the issue in terms of uh, the Syrian conflict I think is twofold. It's, uh, I, I won't repeat what I've said about my views of airstrikes, but what all of us need to do is get back to a situation where the Geneva political process in Syria is given priority. Uh, fundamentally, we need to see a long-term sustainable political settlement to the situation in Syria and I think all of us have a part to play, uh, many greater than those of us in this chamber, but all of us have a part to play in encouraging that process. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister, in light of Scotland's success at the Commonwealth Games, what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that there is opportunity for all to participate in sport and physical activity from grassroots to elite sport. First Minister. Well, firstly, I'm sure, uh, perhaps uh, rarely, everybody will join uh, in agreement when I take this opportunity to congratulate everyone involved with Team Scotland on achieving their best ever away games by winning an amazing 44 medals, which beats the previous medal tally and overseas games of 29 in Melbourne in 2006. The efforts of not just our athletes, but everybody in Team Scotland, their support teams, their families, has been absolutely incredible. And I want to place on record my congratulations to each and every one of them. Um, this obviously demonstrates that Scottish sport is growing in strength and depth with Sport Scotland and our governing bodies developing talent in our athletes, coaching and support staff. That success doesn't happen by accident. It comes through sustained investment and commitment in our whole sporting system. Uh, we've created opportunities through active schools, community sports hubs, and a comprehensive range of performance and national performance centres. Uh, and all of this is enabling more people of all ages and backgrounds to regularly take part in sport and physical activity from grassroots to high performance level. 
Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for answer and associate myself, of course, with, with the amazing efforts of our athletes across here and also take the opportunity to recognise governing bodies, clubs, coaches and volunteers across the country whose relentless hard work has been instrumental in delivering that success. And I would ask the First Minister if she agrees with me that that success at elite level helps to drive participation, but that can only happen if there is accessible opportunity. And, and, and would you also agree with me that opening up the school estate uh, for extracurricular activities, now school activities, and aligning that, those activities with local sports clubs is an initiative that would help to deliver sustainable participation? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that, and much of that is already happening. Um, of course, we have seen with some previous PFI schools, uh, some of them under previous Tory governments, that there are restrictions in terms of opening up sports facilities in that way. But uh, we're doing a number of things. We are protecting Sports Scotland's uh, budget. We have uh, exceeded our aim of creating 150 community sports hubs uh, as part of the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow legacy. And of course, we are investing or have been investing in a range of national performance centres, Orium uh, here in Edinburgh uh, being one of the shining examples of that. But I do agree with uh, the, the thrust of the question that high performance success helps to drive and inspire performance generally. And that's why we will continue to make sure that our funding and our support spans mass participation as well as the more targeted support for our most talented athletes. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I too associate myself with remarks regarding the success of medalists and all who represented Scotland, but there's a but. The government's final evaluation report published this month in the Glasgow Commonwealth Games 2014 states, quote, hosting a major event is not in and of itself likely to have an automatic positive impact on population levels of sports participation and physical activities, so not even hosting makes a mark. Now, given the increase in obesity, even in preschool children, is the First Minister satisfied that the appropriate balance is being struck between elite funding and the humble, but I would suggest more pressing provision of funding to encourage exercise, and I stress exercise, at a very basic level? First Minister. Well, I think Christine Graham raises an important issue that balance is always going to be important and you know inevitably that balance will not always be easy to strike i, I certainly agree that uh, and we've never argued that simply hosting a major event uh, will deliver benefits you've got to work hard to get those benefits which is what we've been doing uh, since uh, Glasgow 2014 and it's what we will continue to do through and after the European Championships that will take place in Glasgow this summer but we also invest heavily in community uh, activity in sports so for example at PE in schools through our active schools program uh, between 2012 and 2016 we invested nearly 12 million pounds in supporting schools to meet our PE commitment uh, and we've seen uh, massive improvement in that we're also doubling investment in active travel we are actually seeing an increase in the numbers of people taking part in sport and many of our governing bodies are seeing rises in participation so for example Scottish Athletics has experienced a 49 percent increase in athletics club members since 2011 for Scottish swimming it's been an increase of 25 percent Scottish cycling an increase of uh, 12 percent and the number of children meeting the guidelines on physical activity has increased from 71 percent in 20 uh, 08 to 76% in 2016. So there's more work to do and we will always need to take care to get that balance right. But I think it's important we do invest in community activity, but it is also important that we invest to give our most talented athletes the best chance possible of going to major competitions like the Commonwealth Games and coming home with medals. Question six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent Accounts Commission report, Local Government in Scotland, Challenges and Performance 2018. First Minister. We welcome the report. It makes a number of recommendations to help councils meet the challenges they face and emphasises the need for councils to develop new ways of working. For example, it says that councils should work with communities to understand their needs and to actively involve them in decision making, uh, which are objectives that the Scottish Government has been promoting through our community empowerment agenda. So I would encourage all councils, uh, as I'm sure they are doing, to consider the report carefully and to take any necessary actions to implement its recommendations. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her reply. She must be worried, as I am, about what the report says about the critical state of local government finances and the warning that councils are struggling to provide care for our older people. This is really serious. So with a mandate to govern Scotland for the next three years, I asked the First Minister, 
Does she have the courage to fix this funding and care crisis so that all older people in Scotland receive the care they need and deserve? First Minister. Uh, well, that's what we're doing. So we've just passed the budget. I appreciate Labour voted against the budget that delivers a real terms increase in the revenue budgets for local authorities. Of course, we're transferring uh, resources from the NHS into social care so that we can not only build up social care services to help local authorities with what they do, but also help relieve the pressure on the NHS. We're taking forward the extension of free personal care to the under 65s. We've taken forward uh, plans already to pay the living wage to those working in our social care services. So we're getting on with doing that work day in and day out. It might be better if instead of coming forward uh, with a constant request for us to do more, but then voting against budgets that we bring forward to do exactly that, if Labour would bring forward something more constructive occasionally to this chamber. And very briefly, Colin Beattie. The First Minister will be aware that the Account Commission report raises a number of concerns, not least the threat posed by leaving the European Union to Scotland's working age population. With Scotland's projected population growth being entirely due to inward migration, does she share the report's concerns that leaving the EU could have an impact on the number of working age people in Scotland, meaning less money for public spending through taxation? First uh, Yes, I do share that concern and I think everybody uh, across Scotland should share that concern. Our population continues to increase. It's now a record high, but that growth has been driven by migration. The Fraser of Allender Institute has also highlighted concerns about the impact of Brexit on migration and our long-term growth prospects. Uh, so it's clear that the UK policy on immigration is not only inhumane, it's also harming Scotland's economic interests, which is why this Parliament has already backed our call for new powers so that Scottish ministers can offer migration routes to those people who want to make Scotland their home. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. We now turn to members' business in the name of Alexander Stewart on RAF 100, the centenary of the RAF. We'll just take a few moments for members and the minister, ministers to change seats.